Hi everyone, this is Walt Bayless with the Business and People Podcast. I'm super excited today. This is our first episode of 2020 that we're recording live and I have with me an expert in the field of workplace communications. It's my pleasure and my honor to introduce Dr. Paul White to you. Now, Dr. Paul is a, a philosophy a doctorate. He has his uh, philosophy major from Georgia University. He actually now specializes in communication at the workplace and appreciation at the workplace, making sure that the teams and the cultures that are being built in the places that you work are ones built around the love languages, being able to appreciate genuinely the people that you work with, eliminating those arguments and that feeling of not being appreciated in the workplace. Dr. Paul has spoken all over the world and has worked with clients including NASA, Microsoft, and some of the other biggest names in the world that you'd see. You can find Dr. Paul's book, which is, let me make sure I get this right, he is the author of The Vibrant Workplace. He's also the, uh, the author of Five Languages of Appreciation in the Workplace, which he wrote with Dr. Gary Chapman, who wrote The Five Love Languages. And you can find all about him. We're going to make sure we've got the links in the show notes. So without any further ado, welcome, Dr. Paul. Thanks, Walter. I'm glad to be with you. It's so nice to have you on the show, man. So you have gone through an incredible academic learning environment, getting that, that uh, psychology doctorate there, and then moving that into kind of the workplace field and relationships environment. How did that all come together for you? Yeah, so uh, actually, I grew up in the context of a family-owned business that my father and grandfather and mom started together, and so grew up within that. I was the youngest of four kids, and so I was sort of on the tail. Never worked there as an adult, but I worked there growing up, through college, and then I was on the board afterwards, and so sort of had that context of, in fact, I remember my father uh, at the dinner table, a, a question often asked was, what needs do you see out there that aren't being met? Nice. Um, and it was just always, you know, looking for needs and opportunities to, not that we would necessarily do it, but just to st start to have that mindset. And so grew up in that context, wound up going to school in Chicago, went into sort of the humanities and, you know, the people side of things, um, moved to Phoenix, uh, got my master's in counseling there, started working with families and out of control kids, and then moved to Georgia, to Atlanta, got my PhD there and then moved to Kansas where I live and have lived for a number of years. And yes, I do know Dorothy, and, uh, but we put Toto down quite a long time ago. Right, so, yeah, it was, it was well past time. It was just you. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I started working with families as a psychologist and developed especially of evaluating students with learning disabilities and reading problems, attention deficit disorders, that kind of stuff. Did that for a number of years. And then a friend of mine, and actually some friends that were business consultants, knew of my background, knew I was a little bit more business-minded than a lot of mental health professionals, and they kept running into family issues because in the U.S., 85% of all the companies in the U.S. are family-owned, even right. really large ones. Yeah. And so um, they needed help with dealing with family issues, so I started consulting with them, maybe two brothers not getting along, our father and son-in-law, that kind of thing, but pretty quickly moved into what's called business succession planning, Mm. Uh, which is a huge issue for family-owned businesses of who's going to own this moving forward, who's going to run it, are those going to be the same, different, and then dealing with the family issues mm. alongside because, you know, mama bear is pretty concerned about being fair, you know, yeah. and not leaving somebody out. And dad, often uh, in the traditional sense in the past, would be more interested in sort of, uh, you know, sweat equity and making sure somebody got, you know, their due for that. And so did that for, you know, 20 years, still do a little bit of that. Uh, but through that, um, my wife and I had read The Five Love Languages by Dr. Chapman. Found it really helpful. If people haven't read it, it's great. It's in, I don't know, 50 languages. It sold 18 million copies. And, um, and then I was dealing with a situation. I was dealing with a father uh, that was head of a big construction company. And we were dealing with a transition plan. I said, you know, how's the plan going? He says, pretty good. My son's stepping up. I think it's going to go okay. I walk across the hall, talk to the son and say, you know, how's this going? He says, this is a disaster. It's wow. I can't ever please my dad. And so um, I thought, you know, maybe the five languages could work here. Um, and obviously we had to get a different concept or term uh, rather than love because that creates some problems in the workplace. Sure. And actually, I mean, part of the story is I pursued Dr. Chapman for over a year mm. before I got a meeting with him. Um, he had a very effective, what I would call gentle bulldog assistant that was hard to get <laughs> through, you know, and uh, 
finally got a meeting with him, pitched the idea. He told me he already had 20 or 25 people that had pitched it, but he you know, said, keep talking. So I pitched the idea of our online assessment, which we've had over, I don't know, 240,000 people take worldwide wow, that fantastic. identifies how everybody likes to be shown appreciation in different ways. And um, so we started on that and then I developed some training materials, started using that and then we wrote the book together. And so uh, perseverance, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah absolutely. Part. Uh, so uh, it's a, it's a long journey for that yeah. overnight success, isn't it? Like it's that yeah. there's so many blocks that have come into play to, to make that all happen. Right. Right. Yeah. And the fact that, you know, the reason he, I mean, later he said, you know, I'm a, a psychologist. So, you know, I have the people side, I've been working with businesses. I knew that. And fortunately we had done our undergraduate work at the same school. And so nice. I had a little bit of the door that way as well. You so. had the ties there. Fantastic. Yeah. So, so Paul, when you, when you're talking to a business, do you, do you uh, typically go into an environment because someone at a C level, an executive level contacts you and says, hey, we've got a problem? Or is your clientele a little bit more proactive in the way that they, they are looking at their growing organization and they start to reach out to you saying, hey, we're getting bigger and we want to make sure our culture is right? Like, where do you typically engage with a, with a company? Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's changed uh, somewhat over the 10 years we've been doing this in that when we first started, it was pretty small organizations, even not for profits, maybe some government agencies, those kinds of things, schools, mm. um, partly, you know, to, to get your feet wet and to, to sort of try things out and, and, and revise them along the way. I mean, I saw that, you know, you call yourself a lifelong learner and I am as well. And I believe our organization is we learn as we go yeah. feedback we get from clients and try to adjust. And so, we sort of grew and then <clears throat> then we got hospitals and you know bigger uh, organizations lots of family owned businesses sort of mid size and usually in there maybe the c suite was involved but often it wasn't it was like maybe the uh, the vp of as you guys say hr yeah. um uh, you know or um, dealing with personnel issues or sometimes just somebody uh, in the middle a supervisor or a manager mm. that had read our book reached out, tried it, tried it with their team, and it sort of grew from there. Wow. Now, more recently, we've been dealing with, you know, larger organizations, but even there, it's not the C-suite. It's um, largely, and I, I don't mean to diss them too much, but people that are at that level aren't in touch with the day-to-day -day pain of relationships within the workplace. It's really the mid-level leaders, yeah. the managers, people who are overseeing supervisors that are hearing the stories. Um, and so, and some of them come at, to us because they, well, here we have, you know, employee engagement surveys where you find out how things are going and they worked on things and they can't get the appreciation piece to move. Mm. Uh, or they've just gotten bad ratings and they know they have sort of a negative workplace and they need to work on that. And others, it's like, we sort of got this, but we need to grow in it and make it yeah. better and make it part of who we are. Mm. And so they approach us that way. And I think part of the issue for us is I grew up professionally in the not-for-profit and social service world where you didn't get paid much, not much prestige, a lot of emotional demands, no money for training. So it was important to me to create some low-cost training materials. And so we did that. We have this appreciation at work online train the trainer course. We had 900 people worldwide take it. Um, and it's just, it's like videos, um, uh, a facilitator's guide, handouts. So you, it's sort of turnkey. You can take it and somebody internally can do it or if you're an external trainer. And, and, and that, that way, it doesn't have to be me. It doesn't have to be a big cost, you know, consulting trainer kind of thing. And I, I think that's uh, worked well for us. Can you us. drop a link for me, Paul? What, what's the link that people can, can get involved yeah, in? Yeah, if, if people, the, sort of the mothership is just appreciationatwork.com. And it's the yep. word at, so appreciationatwork.com. And if they go there, they'll see the book, training materials and all that kind of thing. Fantastic. Very nice. So I think uh, I, I'm always astounded by statistics like, by people like Simon Sinek who say things like 86% of people are disengaged with their daily work life, you know, which, which is, uh, I guess, for an entrepreneur, it, it's, it's something that you're just shocked by. You're thinking, how can 86% of people <laughs> really not like what they do? Um, right. And then as an entrepreneur, you're also thinking, as my team grows, how can I make sure that that's not going to be the case at my workplace. Is, is, the, is the workplace harmony uh, following the Google model, you know, all about foosball tables and, and slides at work, 
or is it much more personal than that? Yeah, it's not the Google model. I mean, <laughs> I live in the Midwest, you know, historically farmers and manufacturers and all that, and they sort of, we roll our eyes at the Google stuff. It's cool, you know, if it works, and, and they've had their own struggles, but that's not in real life for most places. Sure. You know? And so it's really about, um, and, and it's interesting, Gallup, you know, interviewed in, uh, over a million people worldwide, and they found out that your team members feeling valued and appreciated was one of the core factors for engagement. Wow. Um, and if you think about engagement, it's really, disengagement is being there physically, but not there mentally or emotionally, right? Yeah. And so pe people that are disengaged don't solve problems, they hand off things, they don't complete tasks, all that kind of thing. So what we found over time is that, unfortunately, most people don't feel valued and appreciated, even though there's, you know, 90% of all organizations have some kind of employee recognition program. And we really differentiate between recognition, which is an okay thing. It's largely recognition rewards for performance, which is a good thing if it's set up well and implemented. Yeah. Um, but appreciation, we really feel, is about the person. Yeah. Because your people, your employees are people first, right? I mean, we have lives outside of work. Uh, we have things going on. We have other characteristics that would have value besides just what we produce. Yeah. Lots of times leaders forget that, especially entrepreneurs. I mean, and, and I am sort of one. I would say I'm a pseudo entrepreneur. I mean, I've started a business, but I'm not, I've worked with hardcore entrepreneurs and I'm, I'm not way out there. But, you know, you get focused on the results and you, you sort of mow over the people while you're doing it, right? Yeah, or yeah. wear them out and drag them along. And so yeah. we've really found that, first of all, not everybody feels appreciated the same way. So it's not just saying thanks or good job or whatever. In fact, we did a poll. We have over 86,000 people on our uh, subscription list. And good job was actually one of the things that people don't want to hear. Right. Because it's too vague. You know, yeah. I mean, you could say it to anybody. And so one of the things we teach uh, as far as giving an effective piece of praise or encouragement is use a person's name. Mm -hmm. If you're writing it, spell it correctly. You know, yeah. that's good. Yeah. Um, be specific about what they've done or are doing that you value and why it's important to yeah. you, to the organization, to your customer. So it could be, Steve, thanks for staying late and cleaning up after the event. That way we were ready to go when we had this client meeting at eight in the morning and you know we didn't have to rush around. So yeah, use their name, specific, and then tell the value and the importance of it. So but, the other thing that I wanted to jump on there, and sorry to, to interrupt you, but you talk a lot also about authenticity in that appreciation because it's not just about, um, it's, not a, it's not a rote or standard set of phrases that, is, that a, a manager drops across the desk every, you know, hey, it's Monday and we love you kind of thing. Um, right. You talk about authenticity uh, as, as being a key point of that appreciation, yeah? Yeah, so authenticity has to do with that you really do value them and and we talk about you know part of the book the vibrant workplace is that it's identified we identified 10 top obstacles to actually creating a culture of appreciation and sort of the the perceived inauthenticity that's created by recognition programs is one of them another one is some you know, sometimes you don't appreciate somebody i mean they're either difficult or they're not doing what you, you want to and so we say man if you don't don't try to fake it. It's not going to go well. Yeah, but right. Wait, let's, and we give sort of a, a problem solving model. Okay, is it you? Is it them? Is it something else in between? And try to develop it. And early on, I really struggled with, you know, what do you do when you don't appreciate somebody? You just try to grunt it out and say, you know, Bob, I appreciate you, even though I don't know what you do and I don't yeah. really <laughs> you, you know. But, but it's more about spending time with them and learning about them because appreciation flows from value. And so when we value someone, and it doesn't have to be work-related, right? Yeah, yeah. I, mean, it, I like to work with cheerful people more than grumbling people, right? Sure. And so it doesn't necessarily make them a better worker, but they're better, easier to be around. Yeah. Or sometimes while you're having new team members that are sort of getting on board as far as what they need to do, you can call attention to things they're doing in their life and say, man, Stephanie, it's so cool that you're, you know, uh, training for a, a, a 10k race you know i just i think that's cool how you know you're disciplined about that it doesn't have anything to do with work but it talks about their value as a person yeah, right. so we really say if in doubt wait don't try to push through it and get to know them a little bit better and find out what they're doing lots of times i find second level supervisors 
don't appreciate somebody down here underneath because they don't really know what they're doing. And so yeah, you sure. got to find out what they're doing and say, okay, I, I got it. That's they're they're going from office to office because they're setting up networks. You know, they're not just going in our office to office to annoying everybody on the way around and making sure that yeah. their, their solitaire game is up to date. Um, so what we what we're looking at there is the fact that there are multiple levels within an organization and being able to engage with the people on a personal is the wrong word, but on an interested genuinely interested level being able to understand their value to the organization as a person and then reflecting that back to them in terms of appreciation making sure that um hey bob you know we haven't spoken much but i'm, I'm really grateful for abc that you're doing for us and you know you can only do that if you know what that what bob is doing in that particular right. way so don't fake it obviously don't don't say good job bob when you don't actually know what bob's been been up to very very interesting for me paul can i just can i flip just for a second because i know that you've you started with that family background. And so you, you morphed, obviously, with the, the development of, through the five love languages into that, uh, I guess, corporate world and being able to work with those uh, environments. But one of the, the things that I find fascinating is that um, leaders and family members and so many uh, struggles come from that same disengagement in a family environment. Um, and do you find that that appreciation side of things it, when we're talking about family members and communication and kids moving through teenage and all that sort of stuff, do you find that that same appreciation, communication and value is reflected in a family environment as well? I just want to ask that and then we'll come back to the corporate stuff, but I just sure, I'm fascinated sure. by it. Well, sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't, right? But I, I think the way to think about it and I sort of use a, a model, uh, it's called the three circle model of understanding family businesses. You got the business ownership, right? Who mm -hmm. owns it? They get to make the decisions, right? the business management, they're sort of running things. The owners get to tell them what to do and to implement it. Then you have the family circle. It's sort of like the Olympic circles, but just three of them overlapping, right? right? Yeah. And then you have some people that are in the middle. You may have the, the business founder who owns it and who is also managing and is either the, the mother His dad, or mom. Yeah, or mom or, yeah. yeah. And, um, and what becomes confusing is when you're talking to people who are in more than one circle, Mm. And they don't know which circle you're talking from because each circle has its own rules and roles, communication mm. stuff, because the owner can tell a manager what to do, right? right. I mean, yeah. That's, that's appropriate. Uh, but an owner, well, let's say this, a, a dad telling an adult son what to do, well, it's not going to go so well. And yeah. so you've got to know what hat you're wearing when you're talking and there's different kinds of communication. And so, it becomes confusing when the father, son, the mother, son's daughter relationships aren't healthy and they don't have a sense of being cared for and loved. And they're looking to try to get that in the business. Mm. And that, that, that creates problems because that's yeah. not what a business is about. See, part of it is that those systems have conflicting goals. A business is to grow in value, to make profit, right? A family's goal is to care, nurture, uh, and develop. Well, if you hire somebody to care and nurture for them, and I, I worked with somebody. I mean, he hired his daughter. She'd just gotten divorced. She didn't have a job. She needed it. They created a position for her, you know. Oh, man, her brothers were so pissed off because, yeah. you know, it was stealing from the profits of the company. She wasn't adding anything. And, in fact, she was creating sort of this chaos. Wow. And, I mean, the owner had the right to do that, but you have to think through what are the implications to the different systems. Yeah, right. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I think that would be, that'd be muddy waters for, for anyone in the family business environment, wouldn't it? Because there's that role separation. So there can be that, um, I, it's, it's the wrong word again, but dictatorial style of the, the business owner or the managers that yeah, this is where we're going to do it and this is where we're going home. And then like um, an hour later, we're all sitting around the dinner table and there's, it's an impossible, uh, I guess, situation to put yourself in that that dictatorial style and the decisions that are made and the information given aren't going to flow home to the roast dinner and carry on over the table. Absolutely. I mean, and, and it happens all the time, right? I mean, because my wife used to run my practice and at one point we just decided that uh, our, we don't want to talk about work all the time and this doesn't work well. We don't sort of switch well. And so we decided she still does a little bit, but it's not big time. And in fact, I was working with another couple just this last week and there's also a difference between men and women in sort of their neurological wiring that women's brains are more connected all over the place. 
And so they, if you, the guy yells at her on the way out the door and then they go to dinner, guys are able to compartmentalize easier. Yeah. And so we can say, oh, that was work. You know, now we're at home and oh, honey made a nice dinner or let's go to a movie. She's not ready for that. She's not going there at all yeah, because yeah. she's still emotionally tied into the other. So there, there's a lot of complicating factors. There's a great book called uh, Hats Off to You and the number two because it's the cir- second uh, version. And it talks about those different hats and so forth. And That's a good them. resource. That's nice. We'll make sure we put that in. Actually, one of the questions I'd love to ask, Paul, is, is in, in your growth, like in, in terms of your career, going all the way back from that academic starting point through the, the counseling and the, uh, the system where you, you're at now, have you been an aggressive learner? Have you continued your adult learning side of things? And if so, what kind of media or what books do you recommend to people on a pretty regular basis? Yeah, so absolutely. Because when I got into the world of business succession planning, I was dealing with mega wealthy people. I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars, both for the family and so forth. And so I had to learn all about trusts and uh, different kinds of annuities and investments and all that kind of stuff. It was great and it served me well personally, uh, but man, I was studying all the time. So um, I think two points about it. One is a lot of people I think are pretty scattered in their learning or approach to learning. Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes you need to get a skill under your belt. Yeah. And so focus on that. Talk to people who work in that area full time, get some input from them, whether it's a book, you know, most authors now have pretty decent either videos or websites about that and, and do that. I, there's a great book called, uh, integrity by a guy named uh, Dr. Henry cloud. And it's not integrity in the sense of telling the truth. I mean, it includes that, but it's about, um, being integrated as a person Mm. and that as a leader you can't be all over the place and he gives a great example of a boat as a leader and you have two wakes right and one wake is getting tasks done and some people are very good at that the other wake is the relationships along the way right some people at that but some leaders will get tasks done but they mow over people on the way other people you know, keep good relationships with them, get things done. And just the balance of that and being able to sort of um, that's integrate it, that's all of who you are. Is, it's that really sounds like, so that's Integrity by Dr. Henry Cloud. Henry Cloud. That sounds great. I'll, uh, I'll look that up for sure. Dr. Paul, can we, can we see if we can help a couple of people along the way? So the people that are listening to the show, typically they are, they've either started their own journey, they're, they're building their business, they might be, you know, maybe it's just them and they're working hard on that or they've started, they might have a small company or... Quite often we also find that they're, they are driven individuals. They really want to do more with their lives, but they're still working uh, in an employee environment. So can I ask you, that, that person who's still working in an employee environment, they, they're a driven person, they want to do well, but they do find that they've got some toxicity at their workplace. They've got relationships they don't gel with. They've got frustrations with people they don't understand. They have communication issues with different levels of management. All the stuff that we know happens. How would you say somebody who wants to do better could go into work today? Let's say they're on the way to, the car, in, to work out the car in the moment, listen to the podcast, and they get to work. What are some of the ways that they might be able to broach the subject and, and, and change that work environment, do you think? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Walter, because in fact, I'm just finishing up preparing for a, a major presentation in Chicago next week called Neutralizing Negativity. Nice. Uh, and, I, and I wrote a book on toxic workplaces. And what I found is that it's actually fairly simple at one level. And that is negativity, if you want to help it not grow and stop it, is one is don't add to the negativity. Don't throw fuel on the fire, right? Cool. And so if somebody's, some people are around complaining and grumbling. Don't join in. You don't have to call them out, but just say, hey, I'll catch you all later. Because even that action sort of says, you know, okay, maybe we shouldn't be doing this, right? Mm-hmm. So don't join in and, you know, it's easy to do, it but is. just don't. Secondly, you know, that throwing a positive comment out there is sort of like throwing water on the, on the fire. And yeah. it doesn't have to be about that situation or about the person. It doesn't have to be appreciation. It can be as simple as, man, I am so thankful that, uh, you know, I get to work inside uh, I used to work as a carpenter in unfinished houses in the, in Phoenix, and it was brutal, you know? And so I'm like, I'm thankful for air conditioning, or we're in winter now. I'm thankful for a warm house, you know? Yeah, sure. And so, you know, you can always find things to complain about, but just throw a little positive out there. Uh, and 
and it sort of just douses that you know flame going up. So just don't add to fuel to the fire. Throw out a positive comment about something, and you don't have to be Pollyannish about it and say, "Oh, the world is wonderful." You know, <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff, you know. But do that, and then I, you know, I think the other part that we miss a lot is listen to what other people are complaining about and that tells you about their desires yep okay what they want to have happen and if you both listen you don't have to necessarily agree with them you can say oh wow that does sound frustrating um and then try maybe ask a question or two to clarify what about that situation is frustrating to them Mm -hmm. because is it a person is it that you know, a manager or the organization said they're going to fix something and they didn't. Um, and one of the things we know is that our feeling reactions are really a result of the match or mismatch between our expectations and reality. And so when we expect something and it happens, we're pleased, yep. right? When we expect something and it doesn't happen, we're either angry, frustrated, disappointed, discouraged. Makes sense. Yeah, makes and sense. I find, at least here in the U.S., that people have very unrealistic expectations about work and the workplace. Yep. And it's like, you know, it should always be fun and we should, you know, have the, the, the ping pong and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's not the reality for most people in most situations, you know? And so sometimes we have to challenge each other's thinking about that'd be nice. And maybe it happens every once in a while. We get into this all or nothing. It's like, Oh, it never happens. Well, I don't know that it never happens. We have a sunny day every once in a while, you know, yeah. or whatever. And so um, I, I think trying to both listen, because we, I think as our Western culture has grown, we've become very poor at perspective taking, seeing mm. situations from other people's point of view. And that's really the basis for uh, empathy. I think Simon Sinek, you know, this information about empathy is fine, but I think he started too high. We have to, first of all, be able to understand the other person's worldview and how they see life before you can empathize with them. And so we need to grow in understanding what's their life like? Because you know what? A lot of our employees have tough lives, right? They may be a single mom who's raising kids on her own. They may be, you know, they've not had much support from their family and they're trying to do it or there's something else going on, a medical issue. We need to understand what's going on in their lives that maybe makes them tired or irritable or whatever. And if we stop to do that, I think we then can connect and encourage them Not that we're going to fix it all, but we can at least be with them along the way and maybe help provide some support to help them grow. I find that really fascinating. Like above all else, as we're talking about profits and growth and we're watching top lines, you know, being able to relate as a person and and appreciate a person rather than a a job or a workplace um, as as advice, I think is is absolutely fantastic. Something that you mentioned. being a, as, as you're, you know, you're walking, walking through that, you're saying that that particular person, maybe they've got a struggle or maybe they've got, and that, that Pollyanna um, approach from the manager is never going to fix it. But something that you mentioned there was that a, a lot of people have this disconnect between what they expect work is going to be like and work, what work is actually like. I, I have this picture of a cartoon in my head with this guy standing at a podium going, if you think this is going to be fun, you're wrong. Go, everybody sit down, you know, like, I, I appreciate as a boss that there, there, there has to be work that gets done. I also appreciate the, the perspective of um, shouldn't we have lattes for free every Friday? Like, I, you know, uh, there's got to be that balance. How would you suggest a manager, somebody who has responsibility over a team of people, communicates the expectations of the workplace in a way that the employees don't immediately go, ah, I'm out of here? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, again, I think, you know, as a psychologist and a counselor, one of the main skills we learn to help people is to listen and ask good questions mm. and then listen to that. Too often we want to come in with content and say, I know what the answer is. I think it's helpful to intersect and interact with your people and say, you know, what do you, what do you expect from our clients? What do, you, what do you think is that they should do or they shouldn't do? That's sort of what expectations are, shoulds and shouldn'ts. What about our vendors? What about you know, or supervisors or managers, and you sort of listen and say, hear what they think it should be, or, you know, what, what do you think we as an organization should be doing that we're not, and vice versa. Just saying, I'm just trying to explore, 
And that's going to give you, I think, a pretty good sense of, wow, these people really think that, you know, we're rolling in money and that they don't see what I've invested over time. Or the one I have is, you know, I grew up in a family owned business and, and then I have one and it's like, it's a heck of a lot of work. I mean, it's not like you, at least for me, you know, I don't check out at three and go golfing, you know, I mean, I'm working in the evenings, weekends, not all the time, but a lot. And I don't think a lot of people who are not in that role understand how much work energy and also, and I think I didn't understand this earlier in my career, the weight of responsibility of payroll and having other people that yep. you're providing for. And uh, the was, I don't mean this to sound condescending, but uh, an employee doesn't, we would say, doesn't understand the weight of the payroll and, oh my God, if we don't have clients next week, we can't, you know, whatever. Um, and not, perhaps, perhaps neither should they. That, you know, that's, that's the thing. But, uh, you know, again, there's that disconnect, isn't it? The, the boss feels, I'm working 100 hours a week here and you're asking me for Thursday afternoon off. Like, there's, there's a... To say that it all comes down to communication is so cliche, but it's definitely right, isn't it? If we have that valuing, that ability to value the other person and therefore communication are based on that value, I think it would go a long way to solving a lot of those frustrations. Well, I think, I think communication is the tool by which we get to the solution, right? right. Because lack of communication, we're, I'm here, you're there, anything. I'm thinking this, it, and it's like, dude, you're a jerk, you know, and you think I'm a jerk and we yeah, don't yeah. know it, you know? But, and communication doesn't guarantee that you're going to solve it, but it at least provides the pathway to understanding and maybe resolving some of it, right? And that's, mm -hmm. I think the other part is people fall into this all or nothing kind of thinking, always, never, you know, everybody, nobody, I never get, you know, and you got to just challenge that and say, really, never, you've never, you know? Yeah, right. But because it, that's not reality. I mean, yeah. it, it's not love or hate, it's not middle, always right? or never. There are scales of, you know, seriousness as, as you're moving forward. Paul, I think um, like I, I'm so conscious of your time and, and uh, being a business owner, uh, where, where you were saying about, you know, not being able to clock off at three. Somebody said to me once, and I loved it, they were like, uh, you know, oh, you own your own business, so you get to choose your own hours. And I said, yeah, that's right. You know, any hundred hours a week that we'd feel like, you know. <laughs> um, so I am very grateful of your time. I'm very appreciated of it. And of course, uh, if as you're listening to this, folks, uh, you can go to appreciationatwork.com. And, and as uh, Paul said, it is the word at. So it's appreciationatwork.com. And uh, also Dr. Paul White using the DR, drpaulwhite.com for information from Paul. One of the things that, that jumped out at me uh, in, in your sites, in the websites there, Paul, was that you were saying that um, uh, employees turn employee turnover is the largest non-productive cost of any business. So as we're talking here, you know, maybe we've got listeners who are entrepreneurs wanting to move into that space. They may already be business owners. Talking about this uh, idea of appreciation in the workplace and being able to communicate with values, I want to just underline the cost of not doing that. So if we, if we look at this and we, we can say, hey, this is a really nice fluffy conversation that you had with Walt and Paul the other day. Well, hang on a second. Let's put a bottom line on it because as you said on the side there, employee turnover is the largest non-productive cost of any business. So hang on a second. If you've got that environment where people are not feeling appreciated and it is based on their situation and their expectation, if you as a, a company owner or somebody who has influence within the company aren't taking a notice of that, you're actually putting that massive expense back onto the company. And to be able to change the thought pattern about that in, in terms of it's not about, well, they can just go and get stuff because they don't see it my way. Hang on a second. <laughs> you just cost yourself an absolute fortune by yeah. not just changing the channel a little bit and listening to them and their expectations and their frustrations. You can save the company a lot of money by doing that. Is that about right? Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I have an article that's been published in different places called Appreciation Makes Business Sense. And chapter two of our book is essentially that. But we have over 50 research citations that show the business value of appreciation from reducing turnover, reducing uh, late arrivals, reducing absenteeism, people calling in, reducing employee theft, reducing conflict over stupid things that waste time, yeah. you know, and it's just, it, a, a business, a healthy business, it's not about making people feel good. I mean, that's nice. But it, when you have a healthy organization that people communicate and work together well, 
you get a lot of things done. I mean, sometimes people have said, I appreciate the oil, anymore. you know, in the oil in a, a machine yeah. that helps make things keep going. That's a great analogy because you really, you can, you can work miracles in that environment when you have that effective uh, team being able to work together. As you said, you can just tick that list off and it feels like magic. Things are just working the way it should. So that's, that's a great analogy. Paul, I'm so, again, I'm so grateful for your time. Folks, as you're listening to it, and you can feel the, the passion that I have for what Paul's talking about there, head over to appreciationofwork.com, head over to drpaulwhite.com, get in touch, go through some of those self-evaluation systems. And as Paul said, there's that uh, ability to go through a self-taught process of learning some of these skills. Head on over there and grab it. Paul, thank you again for your time, man. I really do appreciate it. And uh, I, I wish you all the very best with the, the growth and all the projects that you've got working through. Uh, I hope we can keep in touch moving forward. Yeah, love to do it again. Thanks so much, Walter. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. All right, take care.